Good afternoon. Thanks for that introduction, which I wrote, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, thanks for coming. I'm going to go through this quickly and uh, talk about uh, a method of mapping that was developed uh, exactly 50 years ago and, and then talk a little bit about where it has gone and, and where it really hasn't gone. Uh, and so uh, I think you all know what a core path map is. It's one of the maps that everybody makes when they're, when they're a student. And, um, I'm not sure that everybody has uh, done the map this way. Um, can I show of hands? Anybody work with Zipatone? Okay, all right, we have some Zipatone people. So before the computer, uh, the way we made these maps was using this material called Zipatone, which came in different dot densities, and then you'd use the exact the uh, the exacto knife to uh, to cut out this this material and then glue it on the map. Okay, that's, that's the way it was done. Uh, I, I looked it up and it's still used for manga. So it's still available. And if you're doing manga, you can you use this. Um, the XY coordinate plotter was a device developed in the late 1950s. It was really in use till the 1980s. Um, it was the most common hardware device for making computer graphics. It was, in retrospective, looking, looking back on it, it was a, uh, it was an attempt to try to recreate what we do with our hand, <laughs> like this, and that was a stupid thing to do uh, because uh, eventually these devices would wear out. They they were really uh, very uh, prone to uh, not working a long time, uh, and so. <laughs> that's nice. Been. Anyway, I spent hours watching those, um, mostly because sometimes they go out of registration and then start drawing over someplace else. And then you have to stop it and start over again. Uh, and so uh, uh, Waldo Tobler used this device to create this kind of map. And uh, he published this in 1973. Uh, really the only way to make making uh, shadings with a plotter was to be, use these crotch, cross hat shadings, which even my mother thought were ugly, <laughs> okay? Uh, but uh, it was, and he figured out, you know, he compensated for the overlapping of lines and even added an exponent so that um, to underestimate for our, our um, perception of the symbols. And so uh, this was introduced and uh, uh, then what do, what do cartographers do with it? You know, you'd think cartographers would embrace this and say, oh yeah, we don't have to do, use uh, data classification anymore, which is, you know, the hard thing anyway. And so it was not embraced, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so cartographers said, this is too complicated for map users. Uh, we need to classify data uh, to make the map more understandable. Um, the purpose of our car cartography is to generalize reality, after all. Uh, and if we don't classify, what, what's the purpose of cartography? What, what do we do if we don't classify the data? We're, we have to add something to the map. If we don't classify it, we're, you know, we're not adding anything. Uh, the response to that was uh, some, some studies, including mine, that uh, did research that showed that these maps could be interpreted as well as class maps. Um, they could, of course, an, estimate individual symbol uh, values better um, because it weren't classified. Uh, and they, we could uh, derive patterns, uh, and far more accurate patterns as well, uh, better than those on, on class maps and compare them, compare maps to each other. All right, and so that we, we could derive these spatial patterns, which is really, after all, what these maps are for. By the way, just a retrospective, because that's the session, uh, all this was done on computer cards, um, and uh, Tobler uh, sent then a pack of these cards to Judy Olson, who was my main professor, and I gave them to me, and that's what I started working on. You might ask what this diagonal line is for. Uh, and that is for when you, the, a card goes out of order. You can see it immediately when a card is out of order. So it was a way of keeping them in order. And that's, this is the machine that actually typed these cards. And that's how this, this was done. Um, you drop those cards off with a tape, and then the instructions for the plotter got put on that tape. 
and then you walk to another room with that tape and put it on a tape drive, and it ran the plotter. And um, that plotter was used a kind of a ballpoint pen, and if your ballpoint pen ran out halfway during the plot, you'd have to start over again. Uh, so uh, that's, that's how the device worked. I got to know the CalComp repair person very well. Uh, he was there almost every week because this device was moving so fast and drawing lines so fast, it was essentially killing itself all the time. It was destroying itself. And uh, of course, it eventually got replaced by raster output devices, which make a lot more sense to make computer graphics. So I took his map, his small map, with I think some areas of Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he was at that time, and then made maps of the US. Um, the map on the left is a four-class quantile map, which is part of the, you know, we can talk about different methods of data classification, but that, uh, that's the one I use there. And then the unclassed map is on the right. Each map took about three and a half hours to make, um, probably multiple attempts because, again, it would lose, lose registration every once in a while. This is Boston University, 1977. Well, as you. Oh, okay. Um, don't know who that was. <laughs> um, all right, so you know, we teach data classification. We spend a lot of time teaching it, uh, probably, and and this is the kind of maps that we show and. And it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, this is the same data and mapped in different ways, and what are we doing? Uh, and then we have something called the Jenks Optimized, which I tell my students they can only use if they understand it. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so then they choose something else, OK? Uh, and so we're, we're at that point where, you know, it, which is the best method data classification? There's no best method data classification. Some are better with some data sets than others, but, but it's, you know, the, we, we cannot agree on which is the best method data classification. Um, a lot of different ways in producing this. Of course, we got away from crosshatch shadings, which was a good thing, uh, and uh, started using different uh, colors. Uh, Adrian Hatzard was a person I worked with in Switzerland, and he put together this Java implementation of it, which no longer works because Java no longer supported. Um, so uh, a variety of things, that, you know, a variety of ways of making these maps. This is a, um, Ken Field, I think, put this together uh, using, showing presidential elections, of course, uh, using both blue and red to show different levels of support here, which makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, and we have here Stuart and Canelli's version using some 3D imagery to try to make it uh, a little more appealing, perhaps, uh, and uh, showing unclassed that maps that way. Some recent work that I've done, uh, and actually a student of mine has done, is to look at whether programs actually produce unclassed maps. <laughs> and so he took uh, uh, a map produced by QGIS and a map produced by ArcGIS and found out that wait a minute, they, 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 they don't have enough shadings. And the, the one from QGIS is actually better, which is a free program, uh, than ArcGIS. It's more, making more shadings, and you can see more of a difference there. So in this particular test, we found that uh, QGIS had 81 different shadings for the 93 counties, um, while ArcMap only had 43. Same data, of course. Um, so I'm thinking what's happening there is that that um, whoever put the color palettes together for QGIS took more time and came up with a bigger array of colors than the person who did that for ArcGIS. Now I haven't, I, I think the person, my student was also looking at ArcPro at that time. I don't know whether that's been fixed in ArcPro, but, uh, but definitely if you want to make an unclassed choropleth map, uh, use QGIS. <laughs> over ArcGIS, which is an interesting thing to say. Um, so then we have uh, uh, the, the question of whether we can really make unclassed choropleth maps. I'm just going to go down that road for a while here. Um, in this particular map of Nebraska, there are 80 different shadings for the 85 different data values. All right, and of course there are eight duplicate values. They would get the same shading. So there are five counties that are classified and 88 counties that are not. So that some, some 
some uh, counties are being put, are given the same shading even though they have different values. Everybody follow that? <laughs> Uh, so dividing the number of unclassed counties by the total number of counties equals 94.62%. So you essentially have 94.62% classified, uh, uh, um, unclassified, and that's it. There's some, that's some that are classified. Now, why are some classified? Well, uh, it's a, so you have to, I'm suggesting a disclaimer that the map is then 94.62% unclassed or percent classed is 5.38% um, and should be used on the map to describe the amount of classification caused by an insufficient number of shadings. Okay, now you think for 93 counties, right, you'd have enough shadings to make an unclassed map. The problem is that some of those values, the data values, are very small, uh, the, di the difference is very small. 0.001 or something, okay? And therefore, you can't, you don't have enough shadings to make a different shading for each data value because they're so close together. So, um, let's talk a bit about what it, uh, what unclassed core plant mapping represents. Um, certainly, it represents one of the first examples of using the computer to make a map that could not be made by hand, okay? We, so we, we were presented with something in 1973. It was obvious. Uh, we could not make that map by hand. There weren't enough zipatone patterns, okay? Uh, we, we, and even if, <laughs> and that, you know, you can't imagine how many zipatone patterns you'd need. You'd need in the thousands to do a true unclass map. Um, and it presented a critical question to cartography about the need for data generalization. Do we need to de generalize the data when we represent it? Um, and then it also represented an opportunity for me and some other researchers to scientifically evaluate how well these maps could be interpreted. Uh, and the result, in the result, of course, we could say is cartographers ignored all that <laughs> and continued to classify data for no legitimate reason. Okay, now we can say, uh, people will argue, yes, we had, may perhaps had some reasons for it, but um, I remember once asking a student you know, we had two maps on the screen, which did they, which they, pref which they thought was better, okay? And they thought the class map was better, okay? And I said, well, why do you think the class map is better? Yeah, it's more contrasty. That's a more contrasty, which means what? It has more darks and lights in it, all right? Uh, and therefore somehow looks better. Uh, and I think that is sort of the reason that we've been classifying data uh, in some ways. It creates a, a representation that uh, looks better, is more contrasty, is, you know, uh, and, and, and that, that's sort of the underlying reason for all of this. So what will it take uh, to move beyond data classification? <laughs> I don't really know, but uh, I think we, one way is to try to steer users of programs to the unclassed approach and away from data classification. Uh, most don't understand the different data classification approaches anyway. Uh, they're using ways of classifying data. They see something that's called optimized, so they choose that one, not really knowing what it does. Um, so again, there's no best way to classify data. In most cases, generalizing data on core path maps is unnecessary. Default core path map uh, could be unclassed, and then you make it difficult in some way to select a classification option. All right. That's all I have. Uh, any any questions? Okay, we have five minutes. Yes. So one, one of the issues that uh, I guess even contentious issues about uh, using unclassed you know, is legend design. Is legend design? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let me let me answer that in two different ways. One one is um, the uh, you know, why, normally with a class map you have you know five legends and you have some sort of range of data values. Um, and the, the question would be as, uh, and I remember Judy Olson asking me this question when I was a student, is what's the purpose of the map anyway, okay? Is the purpose of the map to show va individual values at, for locations or is the purpose of the map to show patterns, okay, a spatial pattern? If the purpose of the map is to show individual values, then let's just put the number in each area and forget the shadings. Okay, then, then people can know what the value is, but then they can, they can also look at a table. 
uh, if they want to do that. So the purpose of the map, uh, of a thematic map anyway, is to show uh, the spatial pattern, okay? And yes, maybe it's more difficult to go to the legend and figure out what the absolute value is, but actually my research showed way back when <laughs> that it's, you can get a better idea of the data value from a, a, a nice unclassed, maybe with 10 shadings, 10 sample shadings, than you can from the map itself. Yes? Yes. Yeah, all right, so I think, I, I think what, I'm just gonna restate your question here, because uh, <laughs> that's the easiest way for me to answer it. Um, the, the problem, I think, with Quilpeth, with the unclassed method, is that it's very, very much um, influenced by outliers, okay? So let's say you have one value that's way up here, okay? And the rest of the values are down here, okay? You're gonna have one very dark uh, area, and the rest of the map is gonna be very light, okay? All right, same can happen at the other end, okay? Uh, a value way down here, that's gonna make one light area. Everything else is gonna be very dark, okay? So uh, that, that is a problem, and, and by the way, this Map Presso program I mentioned about from Adrian Herzog, he, he, he uh, classifies those extreme values, so puts them in, in there, and that's probably why you, you uh, unless the, the, the distribution is perfectly normal, okay, has no outliers, uh, you're going to have to introduce some classification in, a, in an unclassed map. But even if you had completely like five data values with every data point, there was no skew or anything to it. Yeah. The quality of the lightness ramp, the actual colors were pretty much the same. But then the low RGBs, they collapse into looking the same. Like 50 looks like zero. Mm -hmm. So you are, in essence, classing by virtue of a bad lightness ramp. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's the case as well, yeah. I mean, we need to, I don't think there is a good color ramp for an unclassed map, right? Uh, but the, that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah.